This is the Data Color webinar series. We have a co-sponsor for this webinar, which is Hunt's Photo and Video, one of our favorite resellers. And uh, we're going to be covering topics on basically digital workflow for capture today. So any of you who uh, are familiar with the capture tools from Data Color, those are basically the the tools that we'll be using exa as examples for how to uh, to deal with capture. And we're hoping that uh, you'll all stick around. There'll be specials through hunts available to everyone at the end of the webinar. And there will be a drawing for a Spider Checker Pro, which is Data Color's Spider Checker camera calibration target bundled with the Spider Cube scene illuminant and exposure tool. So uh, someone will well, one, of, one of those today, so stick around, it might be you. Now, I'm here today with my friend and colleague, David Saffer. He's in California, where actually the weather has been rainier than it has been here in Maine lately, so that's different. And he's going to be running this webinar and will be speaking to you today. What I'm going to be doing is manning the question and answer uh, section. So what you need to do is, is arrange your screen such that you can see the GoToWebinar control panel and see the, the Q&A section and any questions you have that you type in there, I will do my best to answer during the course of the webinar. Now keep in mind if there's a poll that the poll questions don't go in the question and answer section. There's a separate place for entering those. And um, we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the, the hour while the webinar is going on. So I can see that the, uh, the gates have uh, let most of you in. Uh, there's not a, a rush of, of new attendees coming through anymore. So I think it's about time to introduce David Saffer, who is a professional photographer, fine art and uh, commercial photographer from Southern California, who I've been working with on this webinar series for over a year, and who I occasionally have the luxury of shooting with or doing printmaking with in person. Um, he's going to be covering digital workflow for the capture stage, and I'm as interested to hear this presentation as, as all of you are. So I'm going to, to uh, with no more ado, hand it over to David Saffer. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. This is David Saffer. Um, I hope you'll enjoy this. We're going to talk about digital workflow, and that's a phrase that, um, to tell you the truth, I think doesn't really tell the story. Um, this is more about putting some process controls and some discipline into both capture and output so that um, you can get what you want. You can get what your vision uh, is on paper, in print, or on the display, electronic display. In other words, translate your vision into reality. And that's always what I've wanted. Uh, I originally got started in photography shooting on film, of course. And when digital came along, uh, it was very frustrating for me because I thought, well, this is way too complicated, and it's not giving me what I want. And what I discovered was is that if you treat it like a recipe, which is to, to put the discipline in of getting your chocolate chips and your flour and the butter and the other few ingredients that you need and doing it the right way consistently, the results are pretty amazing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about translating what you want to do in, into getting what you want. Um, quick uh, aside here, this photograph on the front, by the way, is taken in Washington State in an area called the Palouse. It's sometimes called the Tuscany of North America. And I really like the light in this photograph. And the, the real key to getting this photograph to turn out was the exposure. Um, you can see that there's a really wide dynamic range, not so much in the shadows, but running into the highlights. And um, I'm really happy with this and the way it turned out. And the textures in particular in the hillside and the shadowing were preserved because the exposure was good. So let's just um, move right on. In terms of the opportunity, um, the ability to efficiently reprodu reproduce consistent, predictable, and repeatable color across a range of, of devices. And you're going to control your color workflow. You know, a calibrated workflow is always more efficient and predictable. And I'm going to show you why that is. Um, most high-end um, DSLRs and competitors provide excellent capture. 
Um, a lot of the information we're going to present today can be applied to video capture. Each camera and lens has its own color signature. I think that's an important point. Uh, the sensor, of course, is an important uh, issue. Um, the other thing is that lenses, in particular for DSLRs and the mirrorless cameras, have improved dramatically in the last few years. One of the keys to this is the coatings, uh, but it's also the computer controls that are used to manufacture the lenses. Uh, it used to be when you put a, an old lens on a digital camera, frequently contrast uh, and color would suffer because the sensor is very reflective. It was bouncing light around inside the camera and off the rear element of the lens. That's no longer the case. So we're not getting the color shifts, the color fringing, um, the loss of contrast, the loss of color saturation that we used to get. We're getting really, really good opportunities to capture superb color. And you can take advantage of that by controlling your color workflow. Um, you can do white balance in the camera, and you can also do custom white balance. And you can calibrate your camera or create a profile for it, which does give you a bump in color performance. Now, a few quick tips for cameras in color. As I just mentioned, good glass is your friend. I think prime lenses come first. A lot of cameras are sold with the so-called kit lenses, uh, you know, uh, zoom lenses, um, say, uh, I think on this camera it's, a, it's an 18 to 55 or something like that. But there's always compromises in those zoom lenses. Um, and the prime lenses are generally better made, they have better glass, and they give better results. So it's something to think about. Another thing that uh, a mentor of mine taught me is to always to protect the lens. And that means a couple of things. It's not just putting a lens cap on. Protect the lens refers to light and protecting the lens from light that you don't want to come into the front. And in fact, I use this photograph to illustrate something that a lot of people do and should not, which is to shoot without a lens shade. Um, when you let light come into the lens uh, from oblique angles, it does affect your color. It can kill the contrast. It can cause uh, lens flare or um, other light distortions. And so it's a good idea, particularly if you're shooting into the light, to at least have a lens shade on. And in some cases, shade the lens with your hat or a piece of cardboard or even your hand to keep light from, from coming into the lens, from, particularly from above. If you're shooting out in a place where the ground is really bright, uh, you may want to even protect it from that, say out in desert or death valley, somewhere like that. Um, but protect your lens, and you'll find that you'll get better color. Um, larger sensors are more flexible. Um, we're getting, we're seeing better sensors even in the small sizes. Um, for example, the new Fuji cameras uh, don't have particularly large sensors, sensors, but render excellent color. Um, if you're not shooting raw by now, I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't be. Uh, if you have to shoot JPEGs, shoot raw with your JPEGs because it's much easier to edit raw files and get good color. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that daylight balanced lighting is best. If you happen to have an old set of hot lights that you're using in the studio that are running at a, at a color temperature that's pretty warm, um, at minimum what you want to do is gel those lights, put a color correcting gel on them, and get them back into you know, the daylight color temperature range. Even better, put different bulbs in them, or even better, get some of the cool daylight balanced lights or strobes. Um, and, of course, if you're shooting outdoors, that's not an issue. Now, let's talk about the camera and the spider cube. The spider cube, some people go, in fact, I was at Texas Photo School last week, and I got asked an interesting question. Is that like a gray card? And I said, well, it has gray card as an ancestor, perhaps, but it's not a gray card. It's much more. It's a unique design and has unique construction. It's made of an advanced polymer. Um, you can't break it. You can't bend it. If you scratch it, it doesn't affect the color. And it's a tool, really, for color management and exposure management. It can be used for in-camera white balance, which I'll show you in a minute. It can be used in post-production uh, color management for gray balance. It can help you with your dynamic range, a.k.a. The, like the zone system. It's useful for handheld and tethered shooting, um, studio and location work, so it's much more than a gray card. 
So to custom white balance your camera, I'm going to use the mouse cursor here to point out that this outlined in yellow, this is just one camera type. Um, different cameras have different controls, of course. But if you enable the in-camera white balance and you put the spider cube in the frame, and you don't have to completely fill the frame, but get close to it, um, and use the camera's custom white balance sequence, which is usually in the LCD menu, and set the white balance in the camera. And um, excuse me, I left my cell phone on, which is a real faux pas, and I apologize. Um, when you set the white balance in this way, it does something that, that isn't really apparent and isn't called out in the instruction manual. When you're shooting in RAW, the preview that you see on the back screen is, a, is actually a JPEG that's created by the camera. And it's generated from whatever the camera is seeing. And typically it's seeing the white balance preset that you use, say, for daylight or tungsten or fluorescent. And it generates that preview. And it's generally not a very good preview. Um, because those white balance settings are approximations. They are just in the neighborhood of incandescent, and in the neighborhood of daylight or shade. And if you do an in-camera white balance, it's much, much more precise and gives you a much better preview, not only in terms of the range of colors that you see on that limited screen, but also it's going to give you a better histogram, and it's going to, um, what was I going to say? It's going to give you a better histogram. And David, I just drew a blank. Help me out here. Um, oh, and it's also going to help you with your dynamic range, your highlight and shadow detail. So it shows you this semi-processed JPEG, um, not your raw file. And what will happen is the color and density will improve, and your white clipping view, which is the blinkies on the screen, are much more accurate. And this is another thing that this spider cube is good for. If you shoot this in the light, um, that you're going to be using for the rest of your session. And you think you've got your exposure right. You look at the spider cube in the display, and the chrome ball at the top is almost always going to be blinking. That means uh, that's natural. It's a specular highlight. It's right here at the top with uh, uh, circled in red. And if that's blinking, that's normal. What you don't want to have is either one of these white surfaces blinking. Now, if the light is directional, and this is one of the things the spider cube is great at, is it's showing you where your primary light is coming from. Maybe only one side is blinking, but it, if it's blinking, it's telling you that the exposure is set too high, and it'll be flashing on and off. So that's one end of your dynamic range. At the other end, I'm going to back up a slide so you can see this better. There's a black trap in the black face on the spider cube. If that black trap isn't visible on the screen, that means that you're underexposed. So you've got a lot of things working for you. You can judge your exposure. And believe me, the meters in a lot of, of DSLRs and mirrorless cameras are not as good as a handheld meter. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it's the conservatism of the engineers that built the camera. Um, if you can't see that black trap, you're underexposed. And a lot of those meters are set to be underexposed, um, in part because digital cameras are sensitive to loss of the highlights and overexposure, so they push the meter down. Now what you can do is you can use manual exposure or, for example, aperture priority to fine tune the camera and get it right uh, in the camera. It saves time and effort in post-production if you do that. Now if you've taken a picture of the spider cube, let's say you're on set, here's an example. The spider cube is next to a piece of artwork and um, the camera's all set up and the lighting is going. And you take a picture of the spider cube and a lot of the same things apply, particularly if you're shooting tethered. But you can look at the spider cube and you can use the eyedropper to evaluate your RGB values. Um, you can set the gray balance and in a lot of programs, for example, Lightroom, this is Capture One Pro from Phase One. If you set the gray balance in the first photo, uh, you can create settings that will allow that color correction to carry over into all the subsequent shots in, until you make a change. And so that will save you a lot of work in post-production. Of course, you've got that gray field to, to, to use as a reference that's an absolute value. It, it's, it's, going to, um, it's always going to tell you the truth versus 
not having it or forgetting to put it in, which is one of the things I do once in a while, and then you have to guess or find something that's close to gray in the photograph, never perfect. So if you're shooting uh, you know, in Lightroom, um, you're, you're tethered to Lightroom, you're tethered to Capture One or Hasselblad's um, focus program, things like that, or you're doing it in post-production, it's a very useful tool for getting the color right um, and seeing what you wanted, seeing what you want to see uh, in your photographs. Now you can also use the spider cube to set white, black, and gray points in post-production. And this is something that's a little bit esoteric. A lot of people don't know this. Um, you can set the values of the white, black, and, and gray droppers in the levels and uh, curves adjustment layers, for example. Um, and then you can click on uh, white, black, and gray to set your endpoints and your middle gray point. If you double click on the eyedropper, you'll see the color picker come up. And you want to set your, um, for example, I'm working on the uh, highlight values in this particular shot. You want to set your highlight values to a little bit less than maximum. Why is that? Well, the fact is, is that you don't want to set it to paper white if you're going to make prints later. You want it to set it to slightly below paper white. Um, paper white or max is 255, uh, which is the default for Photoshop, by the way. I normally set it to about 245 in red, green, and blue. And that gives me a little bit of ink in the brightest highlight areas, which means that I'll get the most detail out of the print without compressing the highlights. So it's important for you to do that, and it's also important to do that for the black. So you would double click on the black eyedropper and set that to somewhere between five and seven. It's usually, I usually go even up to seven or eight um, so that you preserve a little bit more detail in the shadows. They don't block up with ink. Um, and you get a better looking photograph. It's nice and punchy. You're not going to give that up. The contrast isn't going to go out the window, but it does give you, it gives you the contrast punch with the detail on both of the ends of your dynamic range. That's sort of like having your cake and eating it too. And of course, at the end, it's going to ask you, when you click OK on the curves adjustment, it's going to ask you if you want to save those target colors at defaults, and I encourage you to do yes, so you don't have to remember it the next time. Now here's an example, I hope you can see it on your um, calibrated display, that you set the gray and white balance in post-production, it does make a difference in color. Um, this bowl was shot actually in the studio, um, was shot in the studio, and I used a blue gel underneath on a, on a plexi uh, light table to give a blue tint to the background. Interestingly though, what the camera saw was something with a slightly magenta tint to it. And once it was color corrected using a gray reference, the color is much more true to life. This is really what the bowl looks like. And I think you can see that it also affects some of the other colors, but particularly the magenta color cast is eliminated. Um, I hope you can see that. Sometimes it doesn't come through on the web, but it's, I have another photograph that's even more dramatic. Um, this is a hotel room. Uh, Right here, very, very small, there's a spider cube on the bed, and what we did was clicked on the gray uh, surface of the spider cube, and voila, you have a photograph that's color balanced. Now, it's very interesting that that works that well, because we've got at least three light sources coming here. We have light coming from a lamp uh, behind the camera. We have these two lamps, which probably have some of those, and I hate these light bulbs, those curly Q um, fluorescent bulbs that don't seem to have any single color in them at all. Uh, they're always different in every room I've ever been in. And those are color corrected. They're a little blown out. They couldn't be helped in a shot like this. There's light also coming from over here. The whole photograph comes into line once you have a good gray reference to work with. And of course, uh, if you're working in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom or another raw editor, pretty much in all of them you can use that white balance setting to correct all the photographs that you, uh, that you shot in that lighting setup. And that's a terrific thing. That means you don't have to do them one at a time, doesn't it? Now the spider checker takes that particular aspect a step further. It's a really useful color management tool in the field or studio. It's large and it has a rigid body, which means it's much less likely to get damaged. Um, there are smaller ones available. 
Uh, I have issues with those simply because I feel that the patches aren't big enough. But I also have issues with the software, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, I like the fact that these pigment-based color sheets can be replaced so that if they get scratched or damaged or fade over time, you don't have to buy a whole new <clears throat> device. You can simply replace the panel um, that needs replacing. It has its own software, which is very, very easy to use. It doesn't require you to translate the file into a DNG first. It takes your raw file and simply analyzes that. Um, we've got, on the right side, you've got 24 patches that are nearby or within the sRGB color space. So it's covering a very nice dynamic range and also some very nice bright colors and some more subdued colors. We've got six um, additional skin tones, uh, which is also very helpful, if for nothing else than just a reference. Um, six medium saturation colors to improve color gamut coverage. And we have white tints if you want want to, well, we have white tints and three near black tones, and we have a very nice set of gray ramps. The software generates robust tunable custom cal camera calibrations, which means particularly if you're working in mixed lighting or you're working uh, uh, on a commercial shoot where the color it really has to be spot on. In fact, this happened to me the other day. I was working with some people that uh, make really large machines for um, semiconductor chip manufacturing and they have a specific color for their logo and they wanted to see that exact color in the photograph. Well, I put the spider checker in the shot and used that um, to calibrate the camera and then after that I didn't hear anything about the color of the logo. So when you're really looking for color precision, this is your, this the spider checker is your friend. Now, very briefly, you import the image into the processing software that's supplied with it and you crop it to fit and align it. One of the things you want to make sure that you've done is that you've shot it right side up. Sometimes people turn it upside down. Let's back up a second. Um, right at the top here, um, you'll see the spider check. It says the spider checker on the top left. Just make sure that's on the top left and you'll be good. Um, it does get turned upside down, a uh, little bit embarrassing sometimes. And then you want to make sure that these little shaded squares are in the center of this and you save the calibration. Now it's going to export that. It, you can tell it to send it to Lightroom. You can set it to Camera Raw. Um, you can apply it as a preset and very, very straightforward. Doesn't take a lot of time. Doesn't require a lot of um, special expertise or anything like that. I like this software very much. Um, it makes the job easy and straightforward and gives accurate results. The inverse side of those, uh, of those pages, can be, they can be turned around. On the inverse side, we have really nice gray targets. Um, they can be used, they have the same gray ramp as the color face of the sheet. Um, the large gray patches are set to 50% gray. They can be used for validating your display neutrality. For example, you take a picture of this put it on your screen and uh, a lot of people are surprised to see a color cast on their calibrated display. Um, interesting problem to have which is something we'll talk about later. You can do a quick in-camera balance. Um, you can use this in much the same way that you use the spider cube and create a custom white balance also for your video equipment. Uh, and you can also use it to check lighting intensity and evenness. So if you, if you have this set square to the camera, in other words, parallel to the sensor plane, and you take a shot of this and then you hover the eyedropper over different parts of the gray area, if the RGB values stay the same in your info panel, for example, in Photoshop or on the develop panel in Lightroom, um, you should see the RGB values stay within one or two points of each other. If they vary significantly from corner to corner, you know that the lighting is uneven. You can't do that with a small chart. It's not going to give you a significant result. When you have the larger surface area to work with, you're more likely to see an issue. Let's talk a little bit about display calibration. Um, be sure that you, um, by the way, that you do ask questions at David because we've got a lot of material to cover and I know I'm moving pretty rapidly, so do fire those questions across. And David, make sure you've that David got, you've got one come in already um, that you need to address about uh, setting the highlights to 245 and how you go about doing that. Okay, let's back up. 
It's really straightforward. Let's go back to the spider cube. You've got the spider cube in a shot, and you can do this for landscape photography too. Um, David, what's the name of that device that you put the spider cube on? Oh, there are a couple of extension arms like the X shot that can be used with it that are very handy for uh, holding it out under your scene illuminant. It's, it's a landscape. Or you could use a monopod and you could you mount it on the top and you hold it out in front of the camera and you take a picture. And so when you're when you're back in, you know, when you're back in the studio and you're working in post production, you've got your shot with the spider cube and you're going to use the white eyedropper and click on the white face and the black eyedropper, click on the black face, not the black trap, and then you're going to go for the gray balance. And when you click with the white eyedropper, you're going to set the highest white value, and when you click with the black eyedropper, you're going to set the lowest black value. And the defaults in Photoshop, the RGB values for the highlights are 255, 255, and 255, which is going to print with no ink. It's paper white, we call it. And the black values are going to be zero. And what you do is, if you if you want to customize this, and I encourage you to do that, is to double click on one of the eyedroppers. In this case, the white one. And you're going to see the color picker panel come up, and it's going to show you 255, 255, etc. And you type them in. You type in 245 in each of them, R, G, and B. So it's white, but it's not all the way to a specular highlight value. It's below that, just enough so that the printer will put some ink on the page and you'll preserve as much of your highlight detail as possible. The same thing will happen when you, and you click OK, and then the same thing will happen when you click on the black eyedropper, except down in the RGB values you'll see 0, 0, 0, and you want to set those values to somewhere between 5 and 7. Um, I typically go to 7. Some people say 7 to 9. Um, it sometimes will depend on what kind of results you get with your printing device. That will preserve the details in the shadows. Um, and you click OK. And one of the things that will come up each time you do that is it's going to ask you if you want to save those new target colors as defaults for the eyedroppers. And you should say yes. From that point forward, um, Photoshop will keep those values in the, in the curves palette, for example, uh, so that when you click on the spider cube or your spider checker target on the white and the black uh, areas, that it will set your dynamic range to the proper level. And again, that's, I know I'm repeating myself, but the important reason to do this is to, first of all, give you good contrast in the photo, uh, second of all, to preserve your shadow and highlight detail. How is that, David? Did that answer the question? Yeah, that, that certainly answers the question. This is all really comes from old pre-press pre issues where your dot gain would, at the lower end would clog up the dots on your, on your press and, and the loss of the dots at the high end would lose your highlights. And so we learned early on that you need to protect both ends. And the degree you need to do it with depends on the type of paper you're printing on, the type of printer you're using. So these numbers aren't absolute, but they're safe numbers to use for most printing systems. Yeah, he's right about that. They are safe numbers. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fairly conservative printmaker. Um, that will certainly work for um, glossy and, and luster papers. Uh, when you're working with fine art or matte papers and you're making your prints, you may want to experiment with slightly different values uh, because the dynamic range of those papers is certainly different. You have less contrast, okay, and less color saturation. And so a little bit of um, sort of practicing your touch and go landings, if you will, will help you dial in your settings for different kinds of papers. But those values will definitely get you in the neighborhood. Now display calibration. It's gotten, you know, some people will think, well, you know, displays are better made than ever and it's less important. Well, the fact is that the displays are more capable than they ever have been and calibration is more important than it ever has been. Um, the, the gamut of the displays is improving. It, they're giving you more color and more contrast and you really want to control that. And in particular, 
one of the things, well, I shouldn't say in particular, but in addition to controlling the color, what you want to do is control the screen brightness. One of the most common complaints I heard last week at the Texas Photo School is my prints are too dark. Well, if your prints are too dark, that generally means that your screen is too bright, that you're editing your, your photographs uh, more or less to an illusion. Uh, the screen is giving you a view of the image uh, that isn't really what's in the file. You've got to get that screen brightness down so it's somewhere in the range of what you're going to see from that reflective print. Remember, the screen gives off light, so it's going to overpower the print if you let it get too bright. So it's go the display calibration uh, evaluates a series of color patches, including white, black, gray, uh, and uh, quite a few colors in between, and it compares them to standards. It's going to cal calculate the variance or the difference between what it should see and what it actually does see. And it's going to correct your screen. Now, every time it's going to save that in a file that's read by the operating system, every time you restart your computer, it's going to read that again and correct the screen. So sometimes when you're booting up, you'll see the screen start out. It'll look very blue and very bright, and then it will go, it will change and go into its calibrated state, which is much better for you as a photographer. I also want to suggest something um, is manage your working environment and make sure that your screen is, is really is the brightest thing in the room where you're, where you're doing your photo editing, if, if at all possible. Now, I know this is an eye test, and I promise I'm not going to read it to you. Um, I just want you to understand that the new Spider 4, the, it's, it's, uh, it's new technology. Um, it works with just about anything out there all the way up to and including iPad and iPhones. Uh, and the retina displays, um, LED, um, you name it, it the, the DLPs, it works great with projectors. Um, the accuracy has increased 20 by over 25% as compared to its previous iteration. Um, it has ambient light adaptation if you want it. Um, and some of the software options available, particularly in the Spider 4 Elite, uh, we have video presets for a variety of video environments, um, and gamma white and black luminous adjustments and much more. So it's a very, very capable device. It's as customizable as you want it to be. You can run it on full auto and get great results. Don't be intimidated by all the details here. You can run it on full auto and get great results, or you can dive into a very high level, of, of, you know, a very deep level of detail and really tune it in for special environments or special needs. Now, the first screen you're going to see is not this one when you start the software. It's actually one that asks you what kind of screen you have. Going forward from that, it's going to ask you, are you recalibrating your display? Are you just checking it, or are you doing a full calibration? Some people are concerned about how long it takes to calibrate the display. It's a little over 10 minutes the first time. It's not long. There's not a lot of screens to wade through or controls to fiddle with. Um, it's very straightforward. On the other hand, if you do want to work with different gamma or color temperature values or brightness levels, you can do that. Um, but it's usually not necessary. The defaults work quite well. After you do a full calibration, uh, you come back to it once a month and do a recal, which takes a little over five minutes. Um, one thing I do recommend, though, and it takes a little bit of getting used to, a lot of people will work with this 120 value screen brightness level and find that it's hard to get used to, that it's a little bit too dark, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'd suggest is that it's not that the screen is too dark, it's that your working environment is too bright. You've got to get that, that environment under control. And if that means putting a shade over your nice picture window while you're doing photo editing, then so be it, because that way you can get the screen at the right level, you'll get accustomed to it, and you'll be editing uh, photographs in a realistic way, in a way that's going to let you get a good screen-to-print match. You're not going to be complaining about prints being too dark or color saturation being off. You're going to have that realistic view of your print as you're editing. So it goes through a series of color patches. And you can see on the top, um, I distorted those to make this point. It will correct those color patches to what, you know, to a better value, something like what you see on the bottom. Better accuracy, better saturation, uh, and a neutral gray. Um, it makes a 
translation, if you will, from incorrect values to standardized values. And the wide gamut displays in particular benefit from this. Um, I have a wide gamut display and I find that the mid-tone transitions are greatly improved. Um, edge rendering in high contrast situations is much better. The colors are more realistic, they're more lifelike. The sky really looks blue and the grass really looks green and the skin tones hold up. And so while I'm editing, I have greater confidence that I'm editing the right things in the right way. Um, this is sort of another eye test. Very briefly, this teardrop is the range of human color vision. <clears throat> and the magenta area is Adobe 98 RGB. A lot of displays now are coming out, have been out for a while, that work in Adobe 98 RGB. And you can see that the screen that I calibrated has a gamut that's a bit larger than Adobe 98. Um, some screens, like most laptops, will be uh, sRGB, and that will show you a significantly smaller uh, triangle. But nonetheless, once it's calibrated, uh, it should give you a consistent white point, it should give you a consistent gray point, and good dynamic range, accurate hue and saturation. And we have a screen in the software that really shows you the difference uh, before and after. Here's on the right is a, an example of before, and you can see uh, typically it's too blue and too bright. Um, a lot of screens are shipped uh, and they're set up for office environments and word processing, re regardless of who makes them. And they're too blue, they're too bright, they're not right for photography. And you can see the saturation in the, in the greens here is suffering. The blue sky isn't really all that blue. Um, it just isn't the right, it just isn't right, and of course, um, you know, it's, it's, if it's too bright, you're really going to have issues with shadow and highlight detail. And over here, you can see that the color saturation is great, the green's really green, the blue really pops against the red of the, uh, of the church front. It's really a, an incredible difference, and if, you, if you're not calibrating your screen, you won't notice the difference. Your eye will adapt to it, and once you calibrate it, you're going to be really glad that you did it. There's also another tool with the Spider 4 Lead called Spider Tune, um, and if you happen to have a display that's off a little bit or you want to match a display, for example, to another one, say your laptop to your desktop display, if the you know, laptops are inherently different than most desktop displays. They're made to save power, most of them, and they're made to be lightweight, and they're made to save money. And so the desktop displays are frequently the opposite of that. They're wider gamut. Um, they have a wider range of controls. They can be customized more. And so if you want to match that laptop to the desktop as closely as possible, Spider Tune is your friend. You can set them up next to each other and work with these two targets or work with two photographs and change, and I encourage you to work in small increments uh, to get a better match between the two screens. If you're working in a work group, this is also particularly useful. There's a number of reports that are built into the software and um, these little spider icons are simply telling you what the what the scores are in terms of the rating after the software is done with the tests. Um, and this can be useful in comparing one display to another. Now I put this picture in here. It's a beautiful photograph. I think this is a, um, a great example of uh, someone who has an office with a really beautiful view. And unfortunately, a beautiful view is not your friend if you're editing photographs your physical layout really can facilitate your workflow. You need neutral wall colors, you need to have subdued room lighting, um, and you need to put a shade on the window. So if, 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 the, if the window is competing with the screen, you're, it's a funny thing, but your eye and brain are going to adapt to the brightest thing in the room, and it's going to affect your color vision. And so if the light coming in from outside uh, is too bright, you're going to be editing you know, and making errors, to be honest with you. So the best thing you can do for yourself is to control that work environment, get your screen brightness down to the right level, and, and, and work on a calibrated display. 
Now, here's another tip for you. This is something that a lot of people don't know about, but in both in Photoshop and Lightroom, you can do what's called soft proofing, and that term is a carryover from, again, the old pre-press days. But soft proofing is really live color preview, and what that means is is that you can see the color that you're going to get from your output device while you're editing your photograph. So as you're making changes, you can have things set up so that as you're making changes, you're going to see the highlights and the shadows and the color, the hue, saturation, and brightness will reflect what your output device is going to do. In this case, I have it set to Ilford Fine Art Textured, and that's actually the paper profile that's provided by Ilford for their paper. Um, you can also make custom profiles for papers and use them in this way. But the idea is that in Photoshop, you would go to View, Proof Setup, and go to Custom. And when you click on Custom, this window pops up. You're going to go Device to Simulate. And when you do that, you're going to see a list of all the paper profiles that have been loaded onto your computer. Now, if you own a printer and you've installed the software, the manufacturers provided profiles for all the papers that they make. Those are going to be available to you. Any ones that you add to the system are going to be available to you. And so you can, you can pick whatever paper you're going to be printing on you anticipate you're going to use and edit to that paper's performance. It's an enormously powerful tool because you don't have to wait until you get to the end of the road and you've done all your editing. You go to make a proof print and it's not right. You can see what's going to happen on screen and you can compensate and correct as appropriate. And here's an extreme example. I use this photograph um, in a lot of presentations. I apologize if you've seen it before, but it really gets the point across. A is set for a proof of a glossy paper. And you can really see the difference from B, which is set, I actually used a plain paper preset, the worst case possible, to really make the point. You can see the difference in terms of contrast, in terms of the density, you can, in terms of the saturation, even some of the colors have shifted in some degree. And so with, without that soft proofing, you would never know if you're going to be printing on, say, a matte paper, that you might have the effect that you see in B. It would be more or less showing you what you see in A. It's not really telling you the truth. When you use that live color preview, the soft proofing, all of a sudden, you're in the driver's seat. You know exactly what's going to happen when you go to your output device. Even if you're using an outside lab, you can get profiles from them. And you can see what's going to happen ahead of time. If you have a calibrated display and you're using soft proofing, you're really in the driver's seat. In Lightroom, in the develop module, um, down on the lower left, you can check uh, soft proofing, or you can go um, Command or Control S. Um, and up here, you will see this change. It will change the soft proofing. And you will see proof preview appear. And then you can set it to the profile. And it's exactly the same thing as what you saw in Photoshop. You would pick a paper profile to give you the rendering on screen that you need to know where you're going. You know where you're going. And you're not just driving down the road with, with uh, no idea of what's around the next curve or the, or the next corner, you're actually going down the road knowing exactly where you're going to arrive every step of the way. Now, very briefly, I'm going to cover um, calibration for the iPad and iPhone. Um, you'd have to download an app. It's a one-of-a-kind solution. Um, it's designed to help photographers manage their color output on the iPad and the iPhone. It, it corrects the unique color palette of the, of the, uh, of the iPad. It's um, kind of its own Apple color space and very ingenious method for making this happen. You need a wireless network. You connect uh, the Spider 4 to, say, your laptop or your desktop. Um, you download a desktop app and you click, and once that's installed, you click OK, and magically, this is I, the first time I did this, I told David Toby that I thought it was like voodoo because it's communicating via the USB cable and it's communicating via wireless, and it's, it's just an amazing evolution of technology. It shows you where to put the colorimeter on the screen. You press OK, it runs through the series of color patches, and it's done. 
and although this is not what you would see on the screen, this was put together to show you the differences. This is, this is really a quite accurate re representation of the change that you would see if you calibrate your iPad. Um, just look at the eyes. Look at the change in contrast in the eyes. Much more dimensional, much better color. Um, they just sparkle. They, it, makes it, it, it makes it into something that's, to me, that's, that's much more realistic. Look at the detail in these flowers. It's much different, much different. And the hair. And, you know, I use the iPad all the time. I use it to show my customers what I've worked on, either stuff I've done for them or stuff that uh, I've done on my own, so I'm, I'm doing a demo or a presentation and trying to win the business. And, I mean, which would you rather show, the one on the left or the one on the right? I think the Spider Gallery does a fabulous job and certainly does the best job possible with my, with my iPad in, in showing off my work. Now, here's an issue that comes up all the time um, with DSLRs in particular. Um, Sometimes when the camera is released, and sometimes when people have had the camera for a while and it's suffered its bumps and bonks along the way, and it's back focusing or it's front focusing, um, and it's not it's not the it's not the easiest thing to fix. Fortunately for us, a lot of the newer cameras have a tool built into the menus that allow you to micro calibrate the lens to the camera. Now you have to do this for each lens but you can precision tune the autofocus of the cameras that are supported and it's become quite a long list and getting longer every day uh, as the cameras adopt the, the technology to do the micro calibration um, you can skip shipping the camera to the service department if you want to it's great for field work I know a lot of people that, that go out in the field um, doing wildlife and landscape photography take this along because they get up in the morning and they have a, a, you know, some critical shots coming up, and they check focus on the lenses. And occasionally they'll find with all the bumps and the, and, and the, you know, the horsing around that goes on in the field that one lens or another isn't quite right. And they can go through this straightforward five-step process. So you set up the camera and the lens cow, and you focus on the small target. And it's really, really straightforward. I'm going to back up a little bit. You can see that this is tilted. So you focus on the small target and look at the marks on the ruler. If the camera is focused properly, the zero is going to be sharp. If it's back focusing, for example, the one or the two will be sharp and then the areas below it are going to be out of focus. If it's front focusing, the opposite is true. So you can immediately see whether or not your autofocus is doing what it's supposed to do. Now, what do you do about that? On the back of the cameras are these menus, and you have to look at your owner's manual to figure out where they are. I can't possibly go through all the cameras, but you can move the focal point away from the camera or you can move the focal point toward the camera. And it doesn't take very big adjustments to get this to work. So you can see up on the upper right here an example of back focusing, an example of front focusing. And what you would do is you would make a small adjustment reshoot the target and reevaluate. And it usually takes a couple of tries. But you're talking for each lens about a process that takes five minutes. And it's much better if you get if you're looking at that shot that you traveled all this distance for or the client has paid you to go to a location and shoot in. It's certainly much better to have the camera be precisely focused than not. That's the one thing that you probably can't fix. <laughs> later on in Photoshop or Lightroom is a, is a photograph where the point of focus is off. So the supported cameras uh, include um, cameras like the 5D, Mark III, uh, virtually all the new Nikon cameras, the D800, the D600, uh, the D4. Um, there's more cameras than, than are on this list. Uh, it's it, as the cameras come out, we try to add them to the list, but uh, uh, I certainly haven't got them all here. It's easy enough to figure out if your camera has it. And you know, what about if your camera doesn't have this? Here's the deal: you t you, the, the, the service departments get these requests all the time. They don't believe most of them, so they'll send the camera back to you and say, "There's nothing wrong with the camera." 
On the other hand, if you include a photograph of what you got from the lens count, one of these two photographs, it's very easy to prove to them that, it, that the lens is off. You may have more than one lens or it may be the camera body um, that has an issue. But if you send in that photograph with the camera, I think you're going to get better service. I, I hear these stories all the time and I think that's the way to do it. Um, sending in a photograph where the camera misfocused, they may say, well, you misfocused, not the camera. When you have the target included with the camera, there's nothing to say they have to fix it. So to wrap up, um, we're going to finish a few minutes early. Um, to wrap up, I think you can improve image quality from capture to print, and you start by getting it right in the camera. It's very cost effective. It's, it's easy to use for the beginner. Um, don't be intimidated by the fact that the software and the tools are customizable. The fact that they're customizable just means that it can grow with you, and you can choose the level of customization that you want at practically any level. Um, my suggestion to people is, is it's much better to have some control than none. So get the controls in place. Uh, it will make your life easier. You'll get better quality with less effort. Um, and you'll get real power uh, down the road as you become more familiar with these tools. <clears throat> now we have some upcoming webinars. I want to tell you about them very briefly. Uh, we have one on remote control photography. It's co-sponsored by Trigger Trap, and that's on May 30th. Uh, we have an introduction to color management on June the 12th, co-sponsored by Flurn. Uh, focus control before, during, and after the shoot was sponsored by On One Software, and that one probably takes a little bit of explaining. We're going to talk a little bit about using, for example, multiple focus points in macro photography and combining uh, frames into uh, an image that gives great depth of field, that's one. That's an example. Uh, we're going to dig into digital asset management uh, at the end of June, and that's co-sponsored by Lexar, and that's one that I really encourage uh, everybody to tune into because um, it's very easy to fill up a hard drive. It's not as easy to protect your images against loss, and there's there's all kinds of ways that can happen from the way you handle the memory card through intake to the computer to backup and storage. Um, we're going to be adding more webinars to the schedule. Uh, we'll be ramping that up during the summer, so stay tuned. Okay, now we have a drawing for a Spider Checker Pro, and the winner is James, forgive me if I pronounce your last name, Pagano. James, um, our marketing manager, Patty will be getting in touch with you via email to get your uh, uh, information so she can send this to you. Uh, I want to thank Datacolor and Hunt's photo and video uh, for their kind support for the webinar series. Uh, the web addresses are on your screen. By the way, I want to remind you that this webinar was recorded and it will be available on the Datacolor website in a few days. Um, discounts and rebates. 15% off on all data color products currently listed at huntsphoto.com. <laughs> Your coupon code is 150FFDC, that's on the screen, and it's valid through Saturday, May 11th. Um, customers who order a Spider 4 Pro or Spider 4 Elite will also receive a free Spider Cube. Uh, my contact information, uh, David Saffer Photography, I have a blog. Uh, davidsaffer.wordpress.com. I encourage you to visit it. There's a lot of good information on there. Um, particularly, uh, take a look at the search panel and look around for subjects of interest to you. Uh, I also have a website with some examples of my work at davidsaffer.com, and I do try to answer emails. Uh, dsaffer at mac.com. If you have a question, do send it to me. Uh, if I don't answer you right away, it just means that I got a lot of emails that day. I may have missed your email. Please send it again. I'll try. I'll do my best to answer you um, clearly and concisely. David Toby has a great blog, cdtoby.wordpress.com. A lot of really timely articles. Um, for example, yesterday he talked about the, the change Adobe made in terms of how it distributes its software and going to the cloud. And his website is cdtoby.com. 
Well, I hope you all uh, join us again in the future. We have a lot of great webinars coming up. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Have a great day.